corporate governance and risk management is uh, decisive for a company's uh, success. And uh, in the meantime, if the company is uh, not managing the risks well, and perhaps it will run into financial difficulties. Therefore, governance is very important for all the companies. And today, we are very delighted to have invited Professor Stephen uh, Cheng Yan Leng. And uh, he himself uh, will be giving us a speech on underpinning the best corporate governance practice. He has a lot of experience in this area. So we now welcome Professor Stephen Chung. Thank you. Good afternoon. I am delighted to have this opportunity to be here to talk with you all because uh, for a long time, a lot of people have not asked me to give talk on corporate governance. A lot of people asking me to give talks on uh, fundamental or elementary education. So actually, I have not been uh, a primary teacher. And uh, so it's a very uh, exciting today to be here to talk about uh, the area that uh, I know the best. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, corporate governance and uh, in the Next 10 minutes, I hope to finish my speech. So here's my content. For instance, how to measure corporate governance. Second, what are the relationships between a company's governance practice and market value in Hong Kong? Because this is a very important factor for any corporate governance. If we want to do well, we need resources, for instance, for the management team. We need to help the board to run this well. And in addition to make reporting, so we also need to have resources. So we hope that we can maximize the shareholders' benefits. And why do we need to give out resources to carry out corporate governance? And if the management say that if you do well in corporate governance, the company's market cap will increase, and then that would be a great reason. And thirdly, to look at relationships. For instance, if a company's valuation, if it's improving, so during this period, Will this uh, value with the changes of uh, the company's behaviors also change? And what are the relationships between incremental corporate governance practice and market value in Hong Kong? And in addition, do we have any other measurements or indicators? Number five, uh, we all talk about ESG. So in the past, we talk about CSR. So if the company has a good CSR, we would see that uh, for the market or for, for the investors, this is something that everybody cares about. And finally, so what are the other things we can do well in? And in terms of uh, corporate governance, if you Google, there are many different definitions. And what's more important is about how to set up a system. So within this uh, system for the management or for the board and uh, regulators uh, in terms of corporate governance, they would have a mechanism. And in addition, in terms of the stakeholders, they will also bring some benefits. If you have read about uh, corporate finance, you will know that. So we need to maximize shareholders' benefits. But if you read about this in detail, there is a second sentence, which is to balance the benefits of different stakeholders. But for the professors, generally speaking, they will not talk about the second sentence. Rather, they will focus on the first sentence about maximization of the benefits for the stakeholders. And we believe that if there are good corporate governance practices, the company's value will also increase. So if you think about this, if your company governance is very good, will the market actually punish you for your company's value? Of course not. In Hong Kong, we also have a certain listing rules and regulations, etc. I myself, in terms of corporate governance, so some of the 
different uh, areas, uh, and uh, we can see that uh, these uh, can be measured. And uh, for instance, uh, for the different uh, shareholders, uh, their rights in addition in terms of uh, their supply and demand and uh, the views of the employees and the transparency of the board, etc. So these are quite standardized. However, in terms of uh, best practice, sometimes uh, with the changes in the market, it, it also evolves. For instance, we see a ball uh, keep rolling in front of us, and if the disclosure is uh, better from a company, this will help to build a better governance mechanism. So later on, we will also talk about the situation in Hong Kong. Hong Kong for a long time, I guess about 10 to 20 years ago, CGI was established, and this is to encourage Hong Kong companies to carry out corporate governance, and there is also a framework to assess corporate governance practices. It is in the hope that all the companies, they will have measurements so that this can tell the management team, tell the board what the level of the uh, corporate governance really is. So what do we do if we take a look at this starting from 2002? This was uh, the figure from about 20 years ago, from 2002. So there are four major indices, and we can see that about uh, uh, hundreds of uh, companies that are listed. We have, uh, for instance, the red chip companies and uh, different types of companies. Uh, um, and we look at uh, for different companies' disclosures, and we go over them. So again, based on the uh, five major categories uh, talked about, uh, including, for instance, uh, the shareholders' uh, equities uh, as well as the guidance from Hong Kong Exchange. We have uh, designed certain questionnaires and uh, different uh, questions to help these uh, companies uh, to score themselves. And uh, we can see that uh, in 2020, there are about uh, 203 questions. Uh, so each of the questions would have a score. And if you add everything together, the company would be able to derive a score for their corporate governance. So this is uh, from 2002, covering five areas. There are a total of 86 questions, OECD. We can see that this is OECD recognized because this is a global standard. In addition, this also has a reference to some of the Hong Kong Exchange guidelines. This we can see that we would refer to a certain uh, information from the company. And in 2002, we have a positive correlation if the company's corporate governance score is quite high, and the company valuation would also be high. So there is a positive correlation here between the CG score and the company valuation. Later on, after a few years of data, we then came back and looked at this. So when we say a company is a good company, what it means is that uh, the company's uh, corporate governance uh, score would continue to increase if the company is not a good one. We will see that uh, the corporate governance uh, score will decrease. So basically, between the good guy and the bad guy, we can see that uh, whether the market will punish them or not. So the first thing that we have noticed is that, that in terms of the stock return, Basically, it is actually not that sensitive to CGI, but if it is a good company and in terms of the uh, reward is not very obvious, but if your CGI is low, then the, gov the 
market will actually punish this company. In addition, we also see that uh, for some companies that they are doing even worse and for the companies that are doing okay they are doing well the market will actually reward them so the market felt that this was very effective this was very good so in the market that if all of a sudden a good company turns into a bad one then the com and then the market reaction would be very obvious so these are some of the findings that we have discovered. What about the other countries? We then also used this measurement, for instance, to mainland China, um, Thailand, Philippines, Indonesia, uh, etc. So we can see that in certain areas, uh, the correlation is uh, very obvious. That is to say that uh, uh, sometimes it's a positive correlation, sometimes it is uh, not a positive correlation. Apart from the OECD's measurement. In addition, we also have some other corporate governance measurements, uh, for instance, uh, from Credit Lyonne Securities, and we had adopted some of their uh, guidance and principles. Uh, so now let's take a look at uh, the CSR. And are they actually the same for different companies? And the answer is no. So basically, in terms of a company's uh, CSR, will the market actually value this? And uh, will there be any responses? And uh, again, let's uh, adopt this uh, credit Leon Securities uh, method. And if we take a look at the companies in Asia, if they have a good CSR and the market valuation would also be high especially for a company if their CSR is very good. And for the next year, we can see that their market value for the following year will also increase. So CSR, in a way, is a predictive about how the company's value will do for the next year. And again, for these Asian companies, through improving their CSR, they would be rewarded by the market. Previously, we have an issue of the sample being too small. For instance, from Credit Lyonnais, and uh, they were focusing on uh, big companies, not small companies. So the conclusions would only apply to big companies. In terms of uh, some of the other companies, and in, in the past few years, some of the interesting uh, findings and the papers, uh, if there are some related uh, transactions, connected transactions. So for investors, do not invest a lot of, do not invest in a lot of these connected party transactions. If yes, you will encounter a lot of the difficult issues. And the second, which is the buy high and the sell low. But of course, when we make investment, we want to buy low and sell high. So what is this buy high and sell low? So basically, in terms of the connected party transactions, a lot of the times we see that what they do is to buy high and sell low in terms of asset transfer. And thirdly, we look at these companies, look at their board, and it's similar to as if hosting a family meeting. So the board is basically family members, and how does the market view this? In terms of the market, sometimes they will have a discount on these companies' values. And for some of the good companies in terms of their governance, the current governance environment has changed. And for these companies' environment, we have also seen them changing these companies. They continue to adjust their environment and to uh, adapt to the external environment, and uh, now we see that uh, uh, CSR is very important. Also, dynamic, uh, also climate change is very important. As we have heard that uh, uh, what has been said earlier, if we do nothing, uh, we will end up with uh, no food and uh, end up in a dire situation. In 2050, the Hong Kong SAR government has uh, announced that uh, Hong Kong will strive to become carbon neutral. How do we achieve uh, carbon neutrality? So we had set out the goals, but how do we really provide the different services? Uh, we really need to align the strategies with the goals. 
uh, and for instance, especially with the listed companies, uh, for instance, how do we make sure that uh, carbon emission and uh, for the climate uh, risks, how do you make sure that is part of your corporate strategy? So the strategic objective of the company is important. So walk your talk. Now, this is a stakeholder-oriented corporate governance goal. The goal has certain things built in, one of which is social objective, which includes climate change and carbon dioxide emissions. So this is a new challenge, which should be built into the company's strategic objective, which is important. And how do we use the market mechanism? What is greenwashing? That's just uh, window dressing. Uh, talk without walk, and greenwashing is actually worse. And that is, it is a deliberate practice of pulling wool over other people's eyes. It is a deliberate pact practice of making a company appear more sustainable or more green than it really is. So we need rating agencies to look into the company. We need transparency. And we also need the company to sustain certain uh, regulatory or legal punishment. And sometimes companies do not even care if there is a reputational risk. And what do we do against these companies? And also, we find in the market there are more and more investment products, which are sustainable investment products for companies with good ESG performance. And I think. This is something that is more and more important as a market force. As investors, we invest with our behavior. We invest more into such companies with good ESG performance. But we also have to make sure that the fund managers know between the greenwashing companies and the real companies with real ESG. So the entire system has to be built up so that we all have some responsibility for this 2050 zero carbon emissions goal. This is a social goal. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for the sharing. And uh, would Professor Zhang please be seated off stage? The board in a corporation is very important as steer. And the efficiency and effectiveness of the board is very important for sustainability uh, and business development with huge impact on the business of the company. And today, we're very happy to have invited persons experienced in the governance of companies to talk to us about the future focus on board effectiveness. And they are Ms. Clara Chan. Executive Deputy Chairman of the Federation of Hong Kong Industries, Past President Technical Consultation Panel Chairman, HACGI Inaugural President, CSIA, former com company secretary of CLP Holdings, Mrs. April Chan, Director of CFA Society Hong Kong, Mr. Alfred Lau, Executive Director, Sustainable Finance Institutional Banking Group, DBS Hong Kong, Ms. Serena Mack. And the moderator is Mr. Benson Ju, Head of Corporate Accounting, Financial Management of our company, HKCG. Mr. Ju, please, all yours. Now, before we start this panel, discussion four, let us have a group photo. All right, Mr. Ju, and please be seated, speakers. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. This is the final panel discussion. Well, actually, Professor Stephen Jung had already covered everything we wanted to say in this particular session. And our topic this session is a future focus on board effectiveness. As Mr. Wong, Stephen Wong had said, if we want to have any 
effectiveness in the cooperation. We need the board um, steering and support. All right. I would like to hear from our speakers. The board, with all that work in front of them, and ESG is multivaried and complicated. Does the board have enough expertise and time to discharge its duty in ESG well, whether it is listed companies or corporations? The effectiveness of the board, how do you assess that? And how do we actually have effective assessment of board effectiveness? Clara? For the Federation of Hong Kong Industries, our members number a few thousand corporations, and they include the different industries in Hong Kong, from traditional industries to the most advanced, uh, biotech is also included. So for our membership, the portfolio is very wide. There are listed companies, non-listed companies, as well as SMEs. When we talk about board effectiveness, of course, for listed companies, there are regulatory requirements. And also, there needs to be certain monitoring and regulation of the boards and certain requirements on them. Now, the board existence, is it important? Our observation is that not necessarily we need a regulatory body overseeing the effectiveness of the board but rather as SMEs or in the Hong Kong industrial sector, we have a lot of um, external party responsibilities. For example, our clients, in their transaction with us, they not only look at our service or our products, very often they look at our structure as well to see whether we have a complete structure because this is also one of the counterparty risks. Now let's talk about ESG. For listed companies, of course, we have the responsibility to discharge our ESG reporting. It's required by the regulators. But very often I say for ESG, it is not just to be done by a single department of the corporation. or by one supply chain, but it must be mobilized across a corporation. And to mobilize a corporation, you need the board's role. And in measuring against targets, it has to come from top down, and it has to be company-wide. So for SMEs, for example, this is also important because it affects whether the SME can maintain its competitiveness. When we talk about um, corporations and uh, their buyers, uh, if they're US or European buyers or even from the mainland, uh, a lot of guest speakers have said that in the market, the ESG concept and ESG requirement is already very prevalent among these markets. It's not something optional, but it's mandatory, and it will affect the competitiveness of the corporations concerned. April, in assessing board effectiveness, what are some of the issues or difficulties that you have met with? And what are the resolutions? Well, thank you, Benson. It is true, assessing board effectiveness, I can tell you of the 10 listed company, um, company secretaries, if they are to tell the board that they are to be assessed, the first reply would be, we've done our best already. I'm sure we are the, one of the very best, and we don't need assessment of our board. That would be their response. And therefore, in assessment of boards, we need to be focused. We have to focus on what's in front of us, the future. The future trend of the world is no longer about assessment of the board, but rather it's board evaluation called board progression planning. That makes it all more positive. And the board members would find it more acceptable. Oh, they would say, I've done pretty well. I'm just looking for areas that I can um, excel in or further improve on. So in the board assessment in Hong Kong, well, actually, we are in an early stage, I would say. And it is uh, whether it be pro progression planning or 
evaluation, whatever you call it. You have to look at the board, whether it is effective. And we look at two major dimensions in that. First of all, corporate governance. How is it faring? Secondly, in strategy, as mentioned by the two speakers just now, they talked about the strategy. The strategy has to befit the business. For example, in ESG, the ESG issues have to be integrated into the strategy so as to implement the company's objectives, how to create value for the um, stakeholders and meet the expectations of the stakeholders. So with my board evaluation experience, in the past at CLP, now I've already retired, but during my tenure at CLP I'm talking about, at CLP we were one of the very earliest companies in Hong Kong to have adopted board evaluation. We're now doing board progression planning. It was 11 years ago when we first started this, in Hong Kong at the time, there were only three listed companies which did board effectiveness evaluation. The others were Hong Kong Bank and the Stock Exchange of Hong Kong. For board evaluation, first of all, you have to f convince the board, and that's difficult enough. And f before that, you have to convince your own senior management. Otherwise, the CEO in facing the chairman will get scolded. Now, if you can convince them then you have to consider, do I do an internal or an external evaluation? If internal, then the directors would find it more easy to accept. Usually the company secretary will have a set of questions sent to the directors and they can uh, fill it in and then they can comment on how effective the board was. But from the start at COP, we decided it should be externally done because only then will we have credibility. And therefore, we had to find an independent party. And at the time, in Hong Kong, there were very few external parties doing this kind of work. And the report from this external party in the past, it would not be like uh, auditors you know, they would have an auditor's report after auditing the financial statements to say it's a true and fair view and the stake shareholders would be assured. But for board evaluation, there was no report from that work and there was no assurance for the shareholders. And so when we introduced this and when we decided to do external assessment, we were the first company, I was told by the board evaluation consultant, that we were the first company, to their knowledge, in the world asking for board evaluation result to be published. And the board evaluation consultant needed to issue a report, much like the auditor's report, to confirm that our board practices and processes comply with corporate governance and also there are no big issues existing. So at that time, we were really advanced. And after that, a lot of listed companies I saw follow suit. So if you look at the process of board evaluation, what did it in include? One the composition of the board, the structure of the board, directors, whether they're independent, whether they have specified terms of appointment, and also the committees, the structure, what are they like, and do they have appropriate delegation of authority and meetings? Do they have discussion, real discussions? And the directors, do they have sufficient time to look at the company because we know in the past there was a very uh, famous Lechko member and he sat on 13 boards of listed companies. How can he have sufficient time dedicated to the company? So the stock exchange has a new rule. If you are on seven boards or above, you will have to explain to the shareholders that you do have the requisite time. So when you look at the boards, you also have to see whether the directors have enough time to help with the company, whether the experience is relevant, many, many areas. 
All right. Okay, we need to find the same concept and propose it to the board. This is also quite difficult. To have the word bravery in your heart will do, and uh, sometimes maybe only tell about the good news and hide the bad news. So perhaps uh, are there situations that uh, sometimes you only invite certain people and not the others, but first of all, you need to be clear that uh, you need to persuade the board. You need to persuade that the others, they are willing to write the report for you. And in addition, you also need to be confident. Secondly, in terms of external assessment, and uh, they would also need to shoulder the responsibility. Both sides will need to take this responsibility, but we also need to have the same methodology and to make sure that it's feasible, rather than just reporting the good news but not the bad ones. So Alfred, I'd like to ask you your opinions. And just to share with everyone, I am here today representing companies. And uh, earlier, Professor Cheng has uh, talked about, for instance, good corporate governance can create market value, can help with uh, the stock price going up. And today, I have also heard that uh, a lot of uh, unlisted companies, uh, they are also here today to listen to this uh, event. And uh, for instance, uh, from a an investor's perspective, when the company is doing well, and what price are we willing to pay for this company? Are we willing to pay for a high price? And we need to look at it from an investor's perspective, put ourselves in their shoes. For instance, uh, to evaluate whether the board is doing a good job or not, and investors' um, comments or views are a good way to help us understand this. If the company is uh, doing well, for instance, how do we uh, need to make judgment about how to do it even better? If we need to have some good feedback from the investors, and there are three parts that we need to look at. The first one is transparency. Second is about the board's um, rights. And thirdly, it's about the shareholders' rights. And I'd like to share with you about a an experience that I have had. And uh, for instance, uh, um, if this is a manufacturing process, and uh, for instance, they want to reduce their carbon emission. And in terms of uh, transparency, apart from having scope one, two, three, would it be possible, for instance, uh, to give for instance, uh, some carbon emission uh, reduction targets. And if you have this, investors can see the process more clearly. And secondly, in terms of the board's uh, responsibilities, and uh, we also pay great attention to this because for the board, we need to make sure that uh, they need to have uh, these uh, responsibilities clear. And for different companies, they need to list out uh, their board members' uh, backgrounds and uh, in relevant uh, topics, uh, they can shoulder more responsibilities. And for investors, they could also see that at the board, there are people helping with the execution. This can also uh, give them a higher scores among the investors. And uh, thirdly, in terms of the shareholders' rights, and I do think that uh, for this, uh, you need to answer to your shareholders. And uh, for emission reduction, is it simply about emission reduction? Is it about uh, finding some closer suppliers? But we also need to go deeper in terms of the long-term rights and benefits of the shareholders. For instance, how do we carry out allocations and in terms of the efficiencies, et cetera. These all need to be improved. And we also hope that we can have more communication with the shareholders to give them higher expectations. And for investors, they also need to carry out analysis. A lot of times, perhaps our goals would need to take a few years to realize. And so we talked about uh, carbon emission reductions, and perhaps this would not affect 
the profitability, but investors, they will look for some leading KPIs. You would need to tell them what the role is. In addition, they would also need to find some more effective indicators. And for instance, the inventory days, would that be shortened? Or instance, when the market is getting better, you can get your inventory even faster, and uh, would you be able to grow more in the market and uh, to give more flexibility and indicators uh, to the investors? So you can also help them to understand and to see that uh, these policies have been implemented. Okay. Serena, can you please uh, share with us? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tangas, for inviting me. I have heard a lot of uh, the other speakers that they have said what I wanted to say because for I myself, I look at this from a sustainable uh, perspective and in terms of a company's uh, go governance, it's very important we need to look at 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. For instance, for Tangas, you are going to build a new uh, electricity plant and uh, this is uh, not a small decision and this is for a uh, long time in the future. So the board needs to make a decision. We also have heard that in terms of ESG. For instance, ESG has a contribution. And uh, we have heard this very clearly from Hong Kong Exchange. Apart from the risks, this is also a good opportunity. So it's not about uh, that uh, we have ESG and uh, why we need to pay more money and uh, to find the other, for instance, uh, consultancy firms to write reports, but if you do well in ESG, this can actually help your company to transform. So for the board, they need to first recognize that climate has a certain risks to the business. And in addition, only when you have this awareness can you cope with this. A lot of the listed companies or the unlisted companies, perhaps they do not really have a sustainability committee that can really understand this. Earlier, perhaps you will have also noticed this, that for a listed company, they have a diversified committee. And the so-called gender diversity for the board, this is uh, very important. This morning in the Hong Kong Exchange's uh, speech, we have also heard about uh, gender diversity. What are the other areas? Uh, for instance, uh, we can enhance the resilience of the board. And we really would need to have uh, legal as well as accounting uh, help in addition, apart from such professional help, what about IT, etc. And I also want to say that uh, whether ESG should be a professional in the board. For instance, uh, in Egypt, we have uh, seen what has happened and in Hong Kong and the ex impact of climate change is something that's undeniable. Therefore, at the board's level, do we really do we need to have uh, uh, the awareness of ESG management uh, at the board level. So this is very necessary. In addition, in terms of the uh, data, we have heard from a lot of speakers. They talked about uh, the measurement of the impact, and sometimes it's difficult to find such measurements. If looking for data is difficult, that means the CPI setting is very difficult. Let me share with you some figures. For instance, in the market data, in the whole Asia Pacific, there are 30,000 listed companies. For these 30,000 companies, how many of them at the board's level, they are for instance, uh, having an ESG index that will be connected with their management, there are only 130, so basically 0.3%. It doesn't mean that the board doesn't want to do this. The board wants to do this. However, is it that sometimes they feel helpless? Yes, I think that could be the situation. We have also heard that uh, it's uh, difficult to manage efficiencies. How do we really find what's most important to carry out measurement? But coming back, when we have already established a KPI, apart from the management of the KPI from DBS perspective, these KPIs 
we believe that they could also become a KPI for sustainable financing. So you are not wasting your energy and time to do this. Once you have your own KPI, for instance, you can also help the bank from our perspective. We can look at it with the customer together to look at how we can further develop this. So now that we are talking about KPI, and you talked about only 0.3% of the companies, they have a ESG KPI as well, uh, and this is linked with the management. And uh, the most effective way to push forward for ESG and for KPI, which is that the performance of the management would also be linked with their KPIs. But sometimes it could be difficult. Sometimes the company's strategy and ESG targets, perhaps the timing doesn't necessarily match because EIG might take a long time to realize. So when we talk about the KPI, what do we need to do? And how do we need to solve this? So uh, what's your view, uh, Clara? And I think that uh, if we look at the data perspective, environmental data is easy to resolve because we hear a lot of discussions and this is something that can be measured. However, in society, it's something that's difficult to do. We talk about diversity, we talk about gender diversity. In addition, we also have some experience as well as skills, etc. In addition, for instance, in terms of the health of employees, and uh, we can see that we talk about uh, safety of industries. And we have, yes, indeed, seen that a lot of the manufacturing companies and manufacturing facilities, in terms of the employees' safety, they definitely have indicators. I don't think that any company will tell us that they do not have such a KPI for their managers in terms of, for instance, uh, how many employees have been hurt, et cetera. So I'm sure that they all have such KPIs. And from this level, we can see that there are already some KPIs. And for these KPIs, can they really be translated into the board and whether the board members could do something about this? If we take a look at this, I myself am also learning in terms of operation. We see that they are being deployed, being used, and from a board's perspective, whether this needs to be interlinked with their KPIs. The whole industry is learning about this. And for the large-scale companies, of course, they have better ESG resources and better talents. So we'll talk about this later for SME. It is not necessarily that they are zero. It's not necessarily that they haven't started this yet. It's simply that they are at different stages on different levels. For instance, for E, for environment, for some of these companies, when they establish a factory, they will, of course, listen to the local carbon emission regulations as well as laws and environmental protection regulations. It's just that companies are at different stages. So a can you share with us some of your views? Yes, thank you, Benson. So actually, there are two parts of this question. First of all, we need to look at whether salaries should be linked with ESG. For ESG, it's something that we can look at for the board's salaries. And secondly, for the management's salaries. And basically, there are quite a big difference here. You cannot use the same mechanism to decide their salaries because for these directors, they do not run their companies on a daily basis. And for the management, they are responsible for these performance, even if that they are also responsible by the board. If we look at this by two perspectives, and first of all, for these management team, and generally speaking, in terms of their salaries, apart from a set of KPIs that's set out for them. They can also be linked to ESG. For 
environment, as uh, Clara has uh, said, it would depend on this uh, company's uh, business. If it is a bank, or if it is uh, a, an electricity company and uh, a power company, and of course there are different uh, KPIs. And for a, for instance, a bank company or a trading company, um, and in terms of uh, their data, their environmental data, perhaps there isn't a lot. So how do we find the appropriate environmental KPI? There are many different perspectives, and even if at the moment Hong Kong Exchange has a lot of suggestions. But for international sustainability development goals, there are 17 of them, and each of them will have a number of APIs, and you can choose among them. Now, even though you have chosen among them, how do you measure them? Because at the end of the day, you give me whatever remuneration and you give me incentives linked to these indices, but that can be very controversial. How do you measure? Because at present, there are no international standards, unlike auditing, accounting, which is already very mature in standardization. And for International Sustainability Standard Board that had already been set up, and they are developing different sustainability standards. And this is something in the future. At present, for individuals to peck to these indices is hard. It's just hard. So you have to look at the entire corporate. Instead of individual KPI goals, you say as a corporate overall, these are our ESG achievables, and this is a corporate goal and we have to live up to certain indices. And then these indices will be applied to the individuals. And so that's one way forward. As for directors, of course, ESG is very important to them. And it fits into all that your board is doing, all your agenda. And you have to cover environmental risks in everything, social responsibility and governance, how you're faring there. And this is going to be reflected in the year-end performance. But after all, as I pointed out just now, the directors are not managing the company day to day. They have set these directions, and management will implement them. So in assessing the directors, their remuneration, you can have some ESG measures included in them. But after all, it is about the directors and participating in the company, the complexity and scale of the, com of the company and the business. For example, the business is a, let's say, a power generation company or a bank. For the former, there will be more ESG-related um, factors and more complex, too. So how much are you going to pay in terms of remuneration to the directors depends also on the scale and complexity of the business. And secondly, the workload. Do you have monthly board meetings? Or is it once every three times or half a year? And some actually do not have board meetings um, you know, until a year has elapsed. And what about the responsibilities? Does the individual director chair a lot of committees? The remuneration committee, the audit committee, nomination committee, many of them need um, INEDs, independent non-executive directors. So you should take into account all these factors, these three dimensions, before you determine the remuneration for them. And then benchmark against same industry to see whether this is a reasonable level. And if you want to do even better, you have an external reviewer to look at your results of calculation and then decide whether it is a reasonable remuneration. Now, after that, the recognition will be a lot higher. Legitimacy will be a lot higher because we do find that there is a survey, a very large institutional shareholders survey, and every year they have a vote counting as to whether they support certain companies' directors in continuing their directorship. And compensation, that is remuneration, is a very important factor. Last year, they found that altogether 
there were 576 companies which they voted against. And that is to say, if the components in the compensation or the resultant number of compensation, if it doesn't fit or live up to the investors' expectations, then the institution and investors or shareholders will not support the company. So that's very important. All right, in this kind of economic environment, it's hard to talk about bonus. The board of directors will have to decide how much ESG is worth to them. And so ESG will have to be count, uh, factored in, in remuneration calculation. Now we're talking about talents here. The government is talking about grabbing talents. In ESG, this very important topic, how do the corporations grab talents? How does a corporation nurture talents in ESG? Now I heard that there is or there are ESG professionals and talents. How do we get them? How do we nurture them? Well, yes, uh, Alfred, we're talking about gov corporate governance here. And all along, there's a lot of uh, corporate governance training. And this topic has been around for a long time. At first, we were talking about agency problem, conflict of interest. And at different times, we have different focus on uh, corporate governance. And now there is ESG. ESG is really packaging a lot of the different issues, putting them together. And it is applied to corporate governance. And in the industry and in community, there's a lot of certification, and I'm in participating in that as well. I would say they each have their own characteristics. The CFA one, for example, emphasizes investment, and others are on corporate, on reporting. And in the future, I think it will be a situation where there will be a number of varied um, certification. And ESG in the recent years have been given a lot of attention. And everybody is looking for ways to improve and enhance on ESG. Now, for nurturing of talents for ESG, we would encourage everybody to look at it from your own operation, because corporate governance in the investment world at the end of the day is about the investment. Are investors confident that they hand over their money to you? So this is about long-term benefits. And as mentioned in the beginning, if you stand on the stance of the investor, you'll be asking the same questions. Now, we talk about the board having to be prepared and it really is about risk management. We want the board to have early knowledge of this. Diversity as well, it may not be happening today, but on the other hand, you need such a sensitivity. And of course, we can put in new elements because when we talk about talents, the reason why I say there will be multi-varied certification and um, assessments because there are a lot of young people who are interested in ESG. And therefore, I think in the future management environment, the young people will have their input. And therefore, in corporate governance, we will have new training, whistleblowing, and we want to listen to more multitudinous views. And the young people's view in that mist is important. So whether it is E or S or G, what do they think? That's important. And from the governance point of view, if we look at the news, the young people seem to be having friction and conflict in the employment market. Would it be that in governance, there can be certain young people's voices brought to the board for consideration? Yes, we should pay attention to that. The voice of the young people must not be overlooked. I agree. All right, Serena, you're in banking. A lot of companies are doing green financing, which is part of ESG. How does a company handle nurturing of talents to help the companies do green financing? Now, what Alfred said just now was very true. There's a new paradigm. 
There's another point which I want to raise, and this, that is ESG is not a standalone concept because ESG actually just talks about for the corporation what is important from environment, social, and governance point of view. So for a corporation, whether it is accounting, legal, PR, or manufacturing, engineering, everything can be included into ESG. So apart from the newly joined, who are young people who are taking ESG courses, but also within the industries, there should be professionals who are trained, young people trained or people trained within the industry to very effectively put the industry and ESG together so that they know in their work position and their corporation how they can apply ESG concepts. Now, this can be very wide ranging. Talents would include accountants, lawyers, etc. And during lunch at the same table, we were talking about hey, environmental or ESG, it, if there should be any problems coming out from there, it is a PR crisis. So first of all, you have to understand that it can be potentially a crisis, and your frontline people would think perhaps it is not a big thing, and they're not aware that it is a big issue. So from the bottom to the top, this understanding is important. And secondly, how do we know that we how to train the people? And as mentioned, it is multivarious. There are many, many sustainability-related courses. The Hong Kong MA offers sustainability-related courses. There's CFA and also the European ESG Analyst Program, etc. The Hong Kong government has a repository. The Hong Kong MA has a green sustainable finance training. And in there, there are certain international certification, local certification courses, which you can um, enroll in to upskill yourselves. But of course, when we're talking about government funding to help everybody join force, that would be even better. Right, ESG. I think it is more a culture, wouldn't you say? It's a corporate culture. It's not about a team or an individual um, completing all the work, but the different positions in the company should all come together. Now, Clara, in a corporation, if we are to nurture this kind of culture and the people, what do we do? Well, this is about the corporate as a whole. First, there has to be commitment. This is most important because everything we do if we have commitment and we know how the commitment can be um, propagated in the entire company, we're talking about education really and transparency, all that is important. And especially for ESG, it is a relatively new topic. And a number of speakers have said this is not a standalone topic. And I myself think that for ESG, it is a common knowledge subject. All the relevant subjects in the future should have ESG concept in it. Because as we said just now, if the company is to be run well, if Hong Kong is to run well, all the industries will have to be run well. The supply chain at different notes of it, everybody is working hard towards the same target. E is about carbon, mostly, and at every point in node, you have to calculate the carbon emission and how to reduce carbon. For S, risk management is important. At different uh, departments of the corporation, you have to think about climate risk, energy risk, cybersecurity risk, and there are a number of realms there. And also, we talked about greenwashing just now. For greenwashing, in the data transparency, this is about technology, how technology is to be employed. Perhaps we should use blockchain technology. And there should be a number of different departments. In fact, every colleague need to be participating. 
So for the corporate, as for our own company, for instance, the top management had to do a huge lot of work so that the entire path is clear, our commitment from top down is clear, and there are many, many different workshops so that the um, colleagues will have an understanding of the functions and how they relate to their own terms of reference and the work of the departments, and we're doing all that. April, April, can you please share with us? Yes, no problem. Well, I really agree with our speakers, Clara, Alfred, and Serena, because the talents participating in ESG is very important, whether it is in universities or for internal and external trainings. So what I feel that I need to continue to say is that for each company, each of the company, in terms of uh, what they show, they are very serious about ESG. And uh, what they show, the community show, the society, is that uh, they really pay attention to ESG. And ESG is incorporated in their business strategies to create value to make sure that ESG can be fully incorporated and this can attract young people. So for those people who are interested in ESG, they can then uh, join and work for these companies and they will also realize that it's not simply just about ticking the box. So a lot of the times that if you are simply ticking the box, there's no real future. All the employers need to participate in this together and to really show this side to the young people. And I think that Clara has said this very well. ESG is a, a corporate culture. So how do you make the staff feel that uh, this is something that uh, you are taking this uh, seriously, whether it is a E or S or G, to really show that uh, you really care about this uh, in terms of uh, what you need to do. And uh, for instance, uh, for environment, uh, very simply, for instance, uh, some of the waste paper, can they be recycled? Not only you as a boss and uh, every morning you go to work and uh, say that to print out all the emails that I will be dealing with this, but we see this. But then your secretaries and your staff will feel that the boss doesn't really care about saving paper. So they will also go and print everything they want to. What we need to do is that in terms of the environment KPI, for instance, recycling of paper, in terms of saving electricity, if I'm leaving this room, I will turn off the light or turn off the computer when it's not being used. Um, or have um, automatic switching off mechanisms. So you need to show this uh, to your employees. You need to actively establish and find volunteers uh, to do this uh, earlier. We have heard from Melissa, how do we really drive our employees uh, to participate, uh, not simply just talking the talk, but also walking the walk. In terms of uh, social governance, we can also see that when we are conducting procurement, we need to see that it really needs to go through some internal process rather than just simply decided by one person. We need to be exemplary and to make sure that the people can feel this and this culture is really being promoted from top down. Okay, that's a great way to wrap up, and uh, we do not have much time left. I would like to uh, advertise a little bit, and uh, for uh, Hong Kong CG, we have seen that uh, ESG culture is at the core of uh, Hong Kong CG. We hope that uh, going forward, there will be more opportunities for us uh, to discuss with you all regarding uh, ESG. And uh, thank you again for your excellent sharing. Uh, our panelists, uh, please be seated. We have already heard from so many speakers to talk to us about uh, social as well as uh, 
environmental and uh, governance uh, on their views, uh, and we are very delighted to see the active participation. Apart from our live streaming, we also have a Facebook and a YouTube. We have seen that for this whole day. We have over 5,000 people participating in our event today. Again, I would like to thank everyone for your active participation. We now have come to the final session. We welcome Mr. Zhang Ho, Executive Director, CFO, and Company Secretary of Hong Kong CG to give us the closing remarks. Dear guests, dear friends, at the outset, on behalf of Hong Kong CG, on behalf of Town Gas Smart Energy, I would like to thank you all. I would like to thank all the guests for your participation. Thank all the audience online for tuning in. I would also like to thank our sponsors without their support. I believe that we wouldn't have such a wonderful event today, so thank you all for our event. And I can only use one word to describe it, which is wonderful. I really feel that this has been a great day. There is a lot of great insights being exchanged, and it has been very inspiring, enlightening, and it is very practical as well. It's not simply talking about these high-level principles or ideas, but it's more about people talking from the bottom of their heart. I have benefited greatly. I have participated in a lot of ESG summits, and I'm not simply blowing our own trumpet, but I really felt that I have learned quite a lot in today's symposium. I believe that you all feel the same. You can uh, think about this in ESG is not really a difficult uh, concept, and I have uh, remembered that a lot of people said that it's difficult to work on ESG, but actually not. We are close. It is almost 5.30, and it is a Friday today. I'm not going to take up too much of your time. I'd like to share with you, you know that uh, this year, it's uh, 160 years of uh, town gas, and uh, it's uh, quite difficult to have uh, such a long-standing history in mainland China, in Hong Kong, in this industry. We still account for a very important uh, position in the market, and I have also been in touch with a lot of investors because of ESG. ESG, this mission, this task, it has already become part of our culture. We have heard from our colleagues. He has been with us for six months. He has not just recently joined. So ESG, and we have heard from all our speakers, it is not only just about a responsibility. We feel that it is an obligation, ESG, for our stakeholders. It is an obligation. But of course, for ESG, these three scopes is very wide for environment, for social, for governance and for our uh, stakeholders, regulators, investors, uh, our shareholders, uh, for everyone, we are responsible for this. So we have this responsibility to tell them that we need to do well in ESG. We all know that today ESG, it is here to stay. For this, I believe that it is similar to 20 years ago. And when we talked about digitalization, when we talked about innovation and the disruption of the Internet, and it is the same as those innovations 20 years ago. It is here to stay, and it will bring us great innovations and great opportunities. For Tang Gas, we are very delighted and excited to work with the community, and we hope that in terms of the global climate change, in terms of the carbon neutrality goals of the country, we can continue to join hands and contribute. So this is all I have to say, and again, thank you very much for participating in our symposium today. Thank you, Mr. Zhang Ho, for wrapping up this event. And uh, today, this is the end of ESG Symposium 2022. Again, I would like to thank you all for joining. And uh, if you would like to receive your photos, please go outside and speak with our staff. And again, I would like to wish you all great success. And we hope that we can join hands together and realize ESG for the future. Thank you.